Bonjour my bells and bats, welcome back to my channel and a special welcome to everyone who is new here. My name is Sheena Peril, I am an author and crafter, and on this channel we talk about making things, whether it's with yarn, fabric, or words, and sometimes we talk about the impact of neurodivergence in costuming, writing, and crafting. Today is one of those days. Before we get started, it would be very helpful for me if you could like this video or subscribe, and I'd really appreciate a comment or a share. You can see the video count for this video down below, and every interaction you have with my work tells the algorithm that you like what I do, so they show it to more people. Anyway, let's get started. This is another voiceover video, so feel free to listen in the background while you do something else, or just grab a craft project and join me for some maker time. If you're new here, I was diagnosed with autism and ADHD in early 2013. I also have dyslexia. These three conditions can cause some conflicting symptoms, and I wanted to talk about them a little bit and see if you can relate. If you can't, there's probably a good chance you know someone who has experienced at least one of these internal conflicts, since about 55% of people with ADHD also have a learning disability, usually dyslexia, and according to the CDC, about 17% of school kids were diagnosed with a developmental disorder, which includes autism and ADHD in 2020. As our knowledge of neurodivergent conditions has improved, that number has only gone up, increasing from less than 1% in 2006. Anyway, statistics aside, let's talk personal experience and anecdotal evidence. Hyperfocus versus ADHD. This is the most obvious conflict, and it happens when my autism runs headfirst into my ADHD. Autism means that my brain is wired for hyperfocus, where I get very intensely into a subject or task to the point that I don't eat or drink, I forget to go to the bathroom. This happens a lot when I'm crafting or writing. ADHD can also cause hyperfocus, particularly in women, but it can also cause a lack of tension because rather than tuning everything out, our brains are trying to take in everything all at once. So I might be hyper-focused on my sewing, but I might start out by setting up my space, but then I find a dirty glass on the table and I end up doing the dishes. And then I go back to my sewing, but I need to iron my fabric, so I have to set up the ironing board, which means I discover a pile of unwashed laundry. So I start the laundry, and then I'm waiting for the iron to heat up, so I start hemming a different project that was almost done, and then I remember the iron is on, so I go to iron my fabric for my current project, and then I remember I had some iron-on patches I wanted to apply to something else, and you get the point. So I'm doing a lot of sewing or textile related things, but not necessarily in the right order and not on the same project. And then I look up and realize it's been 12 hours, I haven't eaten, I haven't had anything to drink, and I need to pee really bad. And the reason the cats are being absolute assholes is because I forgot to feed them. Overstimulation versus necessary stimulation. This one and the next conflict are most common for me when I'm working in an office, and they're honestly two of the biggest reasons why I like to work from home, because I can control the levels and sources of stimulation while I'm working. The main way I think about autism and ADHD, in my case at least, is that autism is sensory avoidant, while ADHD is sensory seeking. This makes it very hard to balance them when I'm in an outside setting that I can't control. So a busy open office with customers at the front desk, the phone ringing off the hook, a continual string of incoming emails, plus my coworkers' background conversations, the sounds of construction on the street in front of the building, the music on the loudspeaker, and the pouring rain and traffic noises outside are totally overwhelming to my autism brain. But if I were to try working in complete silence in a private office, I wouldn't be able to focus because not every part of my brain would be stimulated. So I often wear headphones both to block out some of the excess noise while also giving my brain a line to follow, whether it's a piece of music or a podcast or an audiobook. If I give my brain a pathway to use, it stops it from wandering off and getting lost like that kid from Family Circus. Anyone remember that comic? 
Billy is like the ultimate poster child for ADHD in my head. I also have to do this when I'm trying to sleep because if I leave my brain to its own devices at night, it will go into the bad place or it will hyperfocus on the sound of the TV in the apartment upstairs or the obnoxious chirping of the frogs outside my window. If you've been here a while, you are familiar with frog season. Imagine a thousand tiny tree frogs chirping 24 hours a day and that is what I have to deal with every May. Speaking of seasonal changes, please excuse my voice in this video. The hay fever has been really bad lately as we're starting to transition into our fall weather here. Number three, necessary stimulation versus audio processing disorder. This one is very similar to conflict number two, but for me, there's a little bit of a difference. I need some kind of stimulation, like I said. I tend to listen to music or something while I'm working because if I'm working on a report or data entry or something, I'm physically and visually stimulated and there's sometimes a small amount of mental stimulation, but no audio stimulation, hence the headphones or earplugs. But sometimes it's too noisy for headphones, so I go for silence and either leave the music off or I just go for earplugs. And this is because sometimes the stimulation that's making me feel energized is also conflicting with my ability to process a phone call or a complicated email I'm trying to read, or my ability to write down instructions for a new hire, or someone in another department that I'm collaborating with. So I can go from needing to blast metal in order to work, to wanting to duct tape my coworkers' mouths shut, lock the doors, and tie my cube mate to their chair so they'll stop pacing, which are all behaviors generally frowned upon. Number four, hyperlexia versus dyslexia. This next one is super fun and can be really embarrassing. Something like six to 14% of autistic children show signs of hyperlexia, which means that they learn language faster than their peers. This can manifest in different ways, like reading early or above grade level, having a larger vocabulary, or using more complex sentence structures. I was able to read around the age of three to four, though I didn't enjoy it. And as a small child, say under the age of 10, Adults did not know how to handle me because I spoke like an adult. My classmates actually made fun of me because I didn't say words like Pischetti or Library, and I had both teachers and classmates ask me what country I was from because I used more formal English than the people around me. However, I also have dyslexia. In my case, this mostly impacts how I process numbers, but it also has a big impact on my ability to spell and my ability to use the correct homonym when I'm writing. I once had a very long conversation with someone about my ancestors in Wales and was mortified when she pointed out that the country doesn't have an H in it. Pro tip, if you have a kid who reads really well but spells terribly, Get them tested for dyslexia because in a lot of cases, it doesn't impact the input of text as much as it does the output. Logic-based thinking versus dyscalculia. I have always struggled with math, always. Time tests were the bane of my existence in second and third grade and never failed to reduce me to tears. In fourth grade, I had an absolutely awful teacher who couldn't handle the classroom, and she decided to just not teach us long division because one group of students was being too disruptive. That permanently set me back in how I handle math because I was the only student willing to ask what the weird symbol on the board was at the start of fifth grade. So I don't just struggle with doing basic math in general, but doing it in front of people or on a time limit is terrifying and makes my brain freeze. It's also humiliating because my middle school and high school math teachers thought public shaming was the best way to learn if you struggled with something. That doesn't work. For the record. The conflict comes in when we add autism to the mix. I have, a veneer, I have a very linear, logical way of thinking. I want to like math. I kind of taught myself basic statistics and data analysis because I had questions about things and wanted to know more. I used to do a summer research project every year. I remember one year studying the veracity of online horoscopes to see if there was anything to them, 
And my first post retail job, I started calculating the origins of every error or loss we had and discovered that 70% of them came from two people in the office not filling out paperwork correctly. The end result was I saved four people from getting fired for something that they didn't do. I also love numbers and logic, but asking me to do math will send me into a panic attack every time. This is partially the fault of the dyscalculia, but obviously my own childhood trauma plays a big part in this. Polyglot fantasies versus audio processing disorder. If you could pick any superpower, what would it be? For me, it would be instant fluency in any language I come into contact with. I would love to be able to help people who come into my office who can't speak very good English. I'd like to be able to speak to them in their mother tongue and help put them at ease. I'd like to be able to read ingredients on the Japanese snacks I pick up at the Asian grocery store, or ask the waitress at the noodle shop more detailed questions about the food. I'd like to travel without panicking because I can see exactly where my train platform is, where to find the elevator, and get directions to the pharmacy or a government office. I'd like to be able to understand heavy accents. I would like to have been able to talk about crafting with my grandmother before she passed. Unfortunately, I can't do any of that. I've been trying to learn French for most of my life. That was my grandmother's primary language. I spent a year in Italy not just living there, but taking an immersion course. Over the years, I have tried to learn Japanese, Korean, German, ASL, and Hawaiian. ADHD and dyslexia are both connected to audio processing disorders. This means that while I can hear just fine, my hearing was tested annually for a long time because of where I worked, there is a problem somewhere between my ears and my brain that scrambles the signal. If something sounds different from what I expect, for example, a regional dialect or a foreign accent, like I try to speak French to someone who isn't a native French speaker, but is from say Norway, then I can't understand them. In fact, because of my family history, Canadian French is the right French when I hear it, because I grew up hearing my mom speak it with my grandma on the phone. I can understand about 50% of a conversation if I'm hearing it. Parisian French is about 30%. I got used to it in my French class in school, but the words are just way too fast for me to tell them apart. Somewhere in between, oddly enough, is Belgian French. I've never been exposed to Belgian French, but I was watching a French language documentary last year and realized I could understand a lot more of the interviews than expected. It turns out the Germanic influence makes this easier for me to understand because German is a very staccato language with more emphasis on enunciation, while most European French dialects, and also Italian, emphasize the flow of words and blending them together, adding extra syllables as bridges between strings of consonants or vowels. It also means my accent is basically locked in. Apparently, I speak Italian with a lovely French accent. Anyway, that difficulty in hearing makes it hard for me to communicate or understand other languages. I can read French enough to get by, but I can't hardly write it at all. I can muddle through an academic paper in Italian since I was there for my master's, but I can't write it or speak it. If you add a different alphabet into the mix, my dyslexia shuts down and I can't process it. It's like trying to install Mac software on a PC without any kind of conversion or reformatting or anything like that. I want to understand so badly, but I just don't, and no amount of study or practice or immersion has ever helped. Oddly though, this means I'm really good at picking out where a dialect is from, even if I can't understand the words. I can pick out most regional UK dialects, even down to the part of London someone is from, and I can pick out what part of France someone hails from, or even what former colony they're from. The other day, Ash and I were out to lunch with my mom, and we could hear the couple in the booth behind us. We figured out that they were North African because Ash speaks Spanish and could understand part of what they were saying, and I kept picking out random French words and an unfamiliar French accent. But there was something else thrown in there, which was either the pre-colonial language of whatever country they were from, or it was a descendant of Arabic that had mixed with later colonial languages. Number seven, 
social isolation versus social stimulation. This is something that has been really hard to work with recently. My mental health has been very bad of late, which means I'm isolating a lot. The isolation part is largely due to, to childhood trauma, but that trauma was caused by the social difficulties that I face as an autistic person. I think I'm a very clear communicator, but often people read extra layers into things I say or ha I have trouble understanding the meaning of the people around me. Somehow I managed to be both too blunt while also being unclear, and when I'm told I'm doing both at the same time, it's really hard to figure out which one I'm supposed to fix and how. I often feel like the ADHD side of my brain is the one that wants to go out and make a million friends and have social circles and do things, while my autistic half would rather live alone in a cave and never speak to another human being ever again. Most of the time, I don't mind being neurodivergent, but when it comes to math and accents or foreign language, that is where it bothers me the most. Well, that and making friends, because I'm a socially awkward panda, mostly because of the neurological conflicts I've described. Do you struggle with these problems? Have you found a way to get around it? Have you found a good way to learn a language with APD? Seriously, I would love to know. There hasn't been enough research done on it yet, and like autism and women, it mostly seems to be patients talking about it and kind of crowdsourcing help rather than quote-unquote experts with actual information or functioning advice. Next week, I'll be sharing a project diary on the Medici gown, so if you haven't subscribed already, please make sure to do so. Down in the description, you can find links to all of my books, most of which involve neurodivergent or neurodivergent coded heroines, as well as my Ko-fi page, my newsletter, and the sources I referenced at the start of this video. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope you have something cute and fluffy to cuddle with. Ciao!